Good morning, Church Every Day. Uh, it is really a blessing to be back with, here with you guys. Uh, it's a blessing for me, at least. I don't know what it's going to be for you. Um, <laughs> that's up to you to decide. But it really is a blessing. When Pastor Kevin asked me to come uh, and share, he suggested the topic of like freshman orientation, right? Basically, he said to me, like, what would you want to tell every student who's going to be a freshman in college, like everything you ever wanted to know as an 18-year-old? And I was like, okay, that's a simple enough topic, <laughs> you know, like everything I wanted to know when I was 18. That's just like Pastor Kevin. Last summer, uh, when we did the youth retreat, he also basically said, like, what, is, what does every Christian high school student, what should they know at this point in their life, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, wow, okay, that's a tall order. Um, but, uh, but that's actually just like Pastor Kevin. He's got a huge heart for you guys. I know that from just conversations with him, for the youth in particular, but also the parents as well. He's got such a huge heart, and uh, we've had some really cool conversations, and I love what he's doing here with you guys. So it is a privilege and honor for me to be here with you guys. Um, So the topic is broad, right? Um, Orientation to life. So I thought it would broaden out just a bit more than just freshman orientation. What about those of us who aren't going to college anytime soon, right? Uh, Maybe we're much younger. What about those who already been to college many years ago, decades ago? Or even those of us who may never go to college because it's maybe just not part of God's calling on our life to go to college. So how do we broaden that even further out? And so I thought, okay, maybe an orientation to life, right? So the question really is, what are the ingredients for a successful life as God deems success, right? What what does it take? What is the best orientation that anyone can get, any Christian can get to life in general and for that, of course, we have to go to our Lord. Pastor Eugene said, I'm going to share some bits of wisdom. I, I don't know that I have much wisdom. I'm actually going to be drawing a lot from other people. Um, but of course, the wisest of all is our Lord himself. So let's turn to the word. If I can invite you to stand with me, um, we're going to read the word. So please stand, um, as I believe we should read and revere the word of God. And so I'm going to read for us. And you can just follow along, okay? So I'll read, and you can silently follow along. So hear now the reading of God's word. The Pharisees gathered together. One of them, a lawyer, asked Jesus a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. All right, let's ask the Lord for his help at this time. Father, we just come before you, and um, we're just asking you, Lord, that you would make clear the gospel to our hearts. Spirit, we ask you to come into this place and into our hearts that we might hear the truth that is yours. And God, I pray that you would just lift Jesus up so that we can fall in love once again. Thank you once again for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please have a seat. Um, okay, is it, is it just me or do I hear a little bit of, okay, <laughs> sounds like earthquake, no. Um, <laughs> don't say that lately, right? Okay, um, so an orientation to life. I was with a friend recently and... Um, and I just wanted to say that because I wanted you to know I have friends. No, I'm just kidding. So I was with a friend recently, and we're, we're both writers. He's a writer. And it's interesting because he's recently been writing on death and dying, right? Not the most uh, enjoyable of topics, I guess. But he reminded me that if we're going to talk about life, we have to be willing to talk about death. So let me just start with some sobering statistics. I know they're not the, the greatest thing to hear first thing off, but here are some sobering statistics. As of 2010... So just nine years ago, the suicide rate among male teenagers is up by 25%. 2010, right? It's kind of our generation, right? That, in that same period, time period, though, the suicide rate among females is up by 75%. These are some really sobering and staggering statistics, and they're pretty accurate. From what I, I take these from Jonathan Haidt, who's a NYU professor. So what does this tell us? Well, for one... I think it tells us that life gets hard, and it gets especially hard to deal with for some segments of our population. It's just really hard to deal with life. But here's the thing. It's not just millennials who are dealing with this from 2010 till now. I really think there's something going on in our culture, in our society, that makes these statistics what they are. 
So whether you're entering college or entering marriage or entering parenthood, from what I'm gathering, I was chatting with Pastor Eugene about this, or just entering 10th grade, life will probably just get harder. To make matters worse, some of us will probably make decisions that make life even harder. We'll choose the wrong friend group, right? We won't end up parenting well. Apparently, like, if you just choose the wrong color cereal bowl for your child, something's going to happen to their life in a bad way, right? Or we'll just fail to resist a particular sin that's really damaging to our lives. We're going to make tough choices, and those bad choices will end up with harder consequences. So the question is, how do we navigate life in all its craziness, right? What really are the ingredients for a successful life in the kingdom? And I really think that Jesus' advice, or Jesus' great commandment, is our best way to go. So, in Matthew's gospel, you read there's three things uh, I want to take it in the order, though, of loving God with all our soul, and then with all our mind, and then with all our heart, and then loving our neighbors as, our, uh, as ourselves, right? Um, just a bit of background, by the way, in, in Matthew 22, what's actually going on here is that the Pharisees and Sadducees, are just, they're not really interested in the answer. They're just testing Jesus, right? First, they test him about the taxes. Remember that? Like, should we give to Caesar what is his or not? And then the Sadducees tested him about the resurrection. Do you believe in the resurrection? So they're, because they didn't, right? And so the, the religious elite are just testing him. And then finally they get to the, the Pharisees come back and they go, okay, Jesus, if you say, if you are who you say you are, tell us of all the thousands of commandment, commandments in the Old Testament, what's the greatest? What's the great command? And Jesus, his response is what we have here, right? Now, Even though the religious elite were just trying to trick and trap Jesus, for our purposes, the word of God remains true. Jesus' words are actually true. So for our purposes, this will function, I think, to the key to life. How do we live a flourishing, successful life? We look to Jesus' words. Um, And by the way, I mean, just to give a quick illustration of this, um, you know, when you think of, like, how do I find out all the hacks and every single feature in an iPhone— You could watch a ton of YouTube videos and like read a few articles to find out every hidden single feature in the iPhone or maybe the Nintendo Switch, apparently. That's a big one. Um, But if you really wanted to know, what would you do? You'd go to, you'd probably go to Johnny Ive or his, or his predecessor, or his successor now, right? He's no longer at Apple. But you'd go to, you'd go to the guy who made it. And by the way, I I realized after I put all this together, um, maybe, I don't, maybe he, he does a MacBook, right? Maybe he doesn't, anyway, you get the point, like whatever, whoever is in charge of the iPhone, you would go to him. And the same is true with life, right? You'd go to the grand designer of life, which is our Lord himself. So with that, what does the Lord say? Well, one thing he says to us is that we ought to love God with all our soul. And by the way, in soul, when we talk about soul here, I do believe in the immaterial, like the non-physical part of our body, but that's not what Jesus is talking about here. If you compare it against Luke uh, 10, 27, soul just means everything that we have, all our strength, everything that we are, love him with that. Okay, so the question is, how do we do this in a very practical way, right? So before I get practical on how do we love, because that sounds very Christianese, remember that? Like how, with all our soul, what does that exactly mean? And I want to say, we got to go theological before we get practical. So here's the theology behind it. It's called the indicative and the imperative. So stay with me. I know these are big words for some of us. Um, uh, um, for those of us who are like, you know, studying the SAT or whatever. For those of us who already studied the SAT a long time ago, they're still pretty big words. I mean, they're big words for me too. But the indicative and the imperative, right? What is that? What it is is... Um, There's an example of it in Ephesians, the whole book of Ephesians. The first three chapters, the indicative is what we are indicated to be, right? Who we are in Christ. So if you read the first three chapters of Ephesians, you'll come across everything that we're blameless, we're blessed, we're holy, right? We are saved by grace. We're no longer strangers or aliens, but we're citizens and saints, Right? We're partakers in the... So it's indicating, the first three chapters are just indicating who we are. That's our identity, right? First things first, who are we in Christ? Then the second... It's, it's perfectly split in half. The second half of the book, and Romans does this too, by the way, not exactly in half, but Romans starts with the indicative. The second half of the book, right in the middle, in verse one of chapter four, it says, therefore, in light of who you are, I urge you now, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. 
Notice, he doesn't start with the imperative. He doesn't say, hey, do this, don't do that, don't drink, don't dance, don't, right? He doesn't do that. He first says, this is who you are in Christ. Now go and live this way. You're a child of the king. Why are you begging on the street for food? You wouldn't do that because of who you are. The who, the indicative has to come first. Otherwise, why? Other, so, and then, by the way, and then in chapter four, he then goes, says, okay, now go ahead and do this. Put off your old self with its sinful desires. Put on the new self. Now the imperative comes into play, right? Walk as children of light, because you are. Don't walk in darkness, right? Do all that is good, right, and true. And wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives. But if he started with this, the imperative, it would be no different than we as Christians. We would just be moralists. Now, what are moralists? Moralists, oh, sorry, uh, moralists are totally different from Christians. Christians first have our identity in Christ, and then we do all that we do, right? Flowing from our identity. Are you with me? The indicative drives the imperative, okay? Moralists are the ones who go, do, 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 and then you might get an identity from all that you've done. For example, social justice is hugely important. I praise God that Grace Life will be doing that this Saturday in a big way at the homeless shelter. Social justice is great. But notice that non-Christians, if they don't have an identity, they try to find their identity by doing all the things that they do. Why? So that they can feel good about themselves, they can feel less guilty about their sin, and then they can get an identity as a social, ju- an SJW, right? Social justice warrior. That's the new term now, right? If we do enough, I'll get an identity, but Christ says no. Paul says no. You already have an identity, and all that is from the gospel, so now let's live from that identity. Okay, so not to get, so we got the theology down, right? And I, I think I hear an amen. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, <laughs> so let's, let, so, so let me, let's get even practical, right? Even more practical. I was uh, recently, I've, I told you about this briefly. Some of you in the youth, I think, I told you about this briefly before. But there's a friend of mine. Her name is Dr. Park. <laughs> and she and I have been friends for some 20 years. She's been practicing adolescent psychiatry for about 15 years. And uh, one time we were just, uh, my wife, she and a couple of friends, we were just hanging out and, at, her, at their place. And we were just working away and just taking breaks and stuff like that. And then I asked her a question. I said, Esther, what would you wish on every, some of you guys might remember this, what would you wish on every 14-year-old, for every 14-year-old in America, so that maybe, let's just say 10 years later, they wouldn't have to visit your, your office as a psychiatrist, right? What would, you, what would be your one or two wish for every teenager? And parents, I hope you get this, and, and, and teens, and everyone in between, and that's this. She said, she thought about it for like 30 seconds. She's like, one or two, just one or two things? I said, yeah, just one or two, right? You know? I don't have time. I'm just kidding. I said, just one or two things. And she thought about it for half a minute. And then she goes, identity and autonomy. I was like, huh, break that down a little bit. Identity, who, how we are made and who are we are made for. We're made in the image of God. That's our identity. And we're made for relationship with God. Until we get the fact that we are his friend, his child of the king, we are gonna be messed up. She said, if they get identity, if they get who they are, if they get self-awareness, sex, drugs, all other things, peer pressure won't be as strong because they know whose they are and who they are in Christ. They know who they are. They got their identity. Don't you guys think, like, the reason why we try to look prettier every day, the, why, the reason we, we try to work out and look better each, and we try to be cool at school and all the rest, is because we want to be accepted. But can you imagine someone who says, you don't have to look any prettier than you are. You don't have to look, be any cooler than you are. I already love you 100% for who you are. You don't have to try. Don't you think that's what's driving us to do what we do? And by the way, it doesn't stop at 14, right? Some of us at many years later, <clears throat> in their 40s or whatever, um, I'm not 40s, um, we do the same thing. We try to shore up our weaknesses. We don't want people to see whether it's the acne on our faces or the acne of our hearts. We don't want people to see that. And so we cover things up and we do a good job on Instagram and other places, right? But can you imagine, you're so free. The freest people are the ones, those who know they're fully accepted by Christ. Sin, crap, and all, can I say that C word in church? <laughs> and all, sin, crap, and all, God fully accepts us. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that, but Esther says that. Dr. Park, in all her years, she says, every 14-year-old, identity and autonomy. So what is the autonomy bit? Let me just share with you that from our kind of nonprofit, which is, the Renaissance. 
I think each of you has a calling from God. And that mission of God on your life is also going to free you up. You're not going to be distracted. Nintendo Switch is fine. I believe there's a place for recreation, leisure, and all the rest. But you're going to be so caught up with the mission of God. I'll just be honest with you. This morning I woke up very early from Orange County to drive all the way here to this state. I mean county. Um, <laughs> and when I got here, and when I woke up, my alarm, and I, I, I'm honest with you, the first thing I was like, oh, like my, there was a sigh, super early, right? But as I say every time to my friends, whenever I go speak at a retreat or up here at the valley or wherever, and I come back, I'm so exhausted at retreats, especially winter retreats, don't invite me, because I hate the cold. I'm terrible at the cold. How did I survive England for four years? I don't know. But I always tell my friends, maybe not that night, like after the retreat, but the next morning if you were to ask me, hey, would you go back and do it all over again? 100% every single time, right? Because I believe God has called me to something. And whether it causes suffering or a little sleep or other things, which I'll talk about, like spiritual warfare will be part of it. No matter what happens in your life, whatever the distractions come in your way, you'll be so caught up with the mission of God. And I believe every single one of us has a particular mission that only you can fulfill. Now, how does that relate to autonomy? And this, by the way, every calling is sacred, not just pastors and missionaries, by the way. Every single calling is sacred. Engineers to everything. And so we have a board that reflects that from a film, film producer, fashion designer, university professor, my, my mentor. And there's a calling that each of us have. We talked briefly about this. Those of you who came to our workshop last year or two years ago, um, I think got some of this. We won't go into it. I'd love to share this, you know, um, at some other time. But we do have a, you know, passion is what you enjoy doing. Gifts is what others enjoy you doing. And, uh, and you can serve a purpose of God. And I believe that's calling. We can talk about that some other time. But we did some research, and it turns out that mental well-being, like we're talking about, mental well-being is deeply connected to a sense of calling. The, the greater your sense of what you're called to and what your purpose is, the better your mental health will be, generally speaking. So we did some research at my university along with uh, the Renaissance, and what, one of the things we found, in addition to that, is, yeah, purpose and mental well-being are deeply connected, but the way to get purpose is three factors, religion, social support, or autonomy, and the third one is, um, oh gosh, gosh, look here. <laughs> um, uh, religion, social support, and, um, and oh my goodness, oh my goodness. It's something very important, but <laughs> here's the most important part of it all, right? <laughs> here's probably why I forgot. Oh my gosh, my, my, my research assistants are gonna kill me. They're like, um, the third, the, the, the thing that mattered most, believe it or not, it wasn't even religion. It wasn't even that you were convinced there's a God who has a purpose for your life because most people said, oh, purpose, yeah, I'm supposed to glorify God. But no, specifically, it was autonomy. So parents, this is where it comes in. I would encourage us to try to think through our kid. And if you're a kid, if you're thinking about this, it matters that you, with God and with community and your parents, but you have to discern what that calling is, autonomy. It can't be pressured on you by parents or even society. It has to be yours. Once you figure out what your calling is from God autonomously, then you will actually, it'll lead you to that sense of purpose and that a strong mental health. Because we're, it's far too long that we as parents have told our children what they should be and that's why we see a lot of, like Jeremy Lin is an example and his friends too at Palo Alto High School. You guys can read, you, some of you guys know about that article where he writes about that. Right? When you have your own sense of autonomy, your own sense of calling from God, yes, with input from parents and mentors and right, community, but it has to be discerned between you and God because it's going to last you, God willing, 70 years further from here. Right? Now I'm curious what the third thing is, too. <laughs> what is it? Social support is the thing about um, having... Um, oh, no, no, you're exactly right. Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, social support, meaning mentors. Mentors need to help guide. You need to have social support, too. But the number one of the three factors was autonomy, was the middle one. That was the, the one that you see with the correlation on the bottom middle graph there. Okay, it's the highest, it has the highest correlation. Okay, thanks, brother, I owe you one. <laughs> okay, so uh, let, let's move on. Oh, my gosh. Um, I forget, what time do I end? I know Pastor Kevin said 40 minutes, so... Um, 45? Okay, 11.45. Perfect. No, okay. <laughs> all right, okay. Um, <laughs> it's a joke, man. You all got serious on me right there. 
But I'll just give you a real quick example. Oh my gosh, 20 minutes. Okay, so um, when I graduated college, I, I, w I, was, I was wandering. I didn't have my deep sense of calling. And uh, I didn't know where I was supposed to. I did everything. I worked out from everyone from Macy's Men's Store to a law firm to a Christian magazine. I was wandering, right? And I can tell you, I actually did fall into a deep um, bout of depression. I, I, it wasn't as bad as um, another one that I've experienced, but it was bad. And um, believe it or not, you know, you get all kinds of things to try to help you along the way and people and so forth. But the one thing that really helped shift is that I started substitute teaching at a high school, just substitute teaching. But just that daily getting up and having something to do, which I learned I kind of am pretty decent at. I love teaching and it's, the kids seem to love it too. So my sense of worth and my sense of work were connected, not in identical. Don't identify yourself with your job. But there's a deep connection, nonetheless, between work and well-being, right? Between purpose and well-being. My other friend, Tom, oh gosh, um, I have to edit this video, but I almost said his name, but uh, uh, <clears throat> Ted um, <laughs> said that when he was, he passed the bar exam, he took the bar exam. He didn't know that he passed. He really was sure that he didn't pass. And for many months now, being out of law school and before being employed at a law firm, he just, there was nothing he could do and nothing that he was doing. And so he actually fell into a deep, deep, ended up in the hospital because of his depression and some other things that he did as a result of that. Literally, after he got the, uh, got the results of his bar exam, he did pass. He just didn't think he did. He did pass. And then within a few months, got an offer from a law firm. And when he started there, his life changed right away. My point is, we are meant to do work. We're made for communion with God, which is our identity, but we're also, we have a calling from God, and that's our calling, okay? So I really want to encourage you guys to think through this. And this is my best attempt, you guys, at life orientation in 40 minutes. So that's what I believe it means to serve God with all our soul. Let me move to the second point. This one we can be quick on because loving God with our minds, I think we can be quick because if there's any church in the SoCal area that I'm familiar with, actually this church is one that does that really well. You guys value and live out the importance of loving God with all your mind. So I can be quite quick on this. So all I want to say is two quick things on this. First is let's, read, let's learn to read wisely and to read widely. What do I mean? In terms of reading wisely, um, I had a Bible study leader in college who had these nice pithy sayings he would always say. And one of them was this. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. Right? The heart you can praise God all out and say, I love Jesus, but if you don't know anything about the Jesus that we're talking about, then how much do we really love him, right? So the heart cannot love what the mind doesn't know. Now, um, so, so again, I'll give you an example in my own life. I um, went through a period of doubt in college. Uh, my, my, every professor on campus pretty much said God is, Christianity is false, God is all made up, and I actually began to wonder, did, I, did my faith just, did I just inherit inherit it like I inherited my genes from my parents? Is it just because my pastors preached every Sunday that Christianity is true that I believed it? And I really began to doubt Christianity as a whole, my salvation, God's existence, everything I started doubting. This one year of college, 10 months, was just sheer agony. I was up to two, three, four in the morning badgering my friends. I was like, how do you know this stuff is real? And all they kept saying back to me is, you gotta have faith. I know Pastor Kevin, Pastor Eugene doesn't stand for that. You can't just say, oh, you gotta have faith. You gotta know this stuff is real. Otherwise, you're not gonna live like it's real, right? So, so uh, I went through this 10-month pe uh, period of doubt. I'm gonna encourage you. Here's a book that really helped me. When we read that verse, we're like, oh yeah, of course, John 3, 6, uh-huh, everyone knows that God sent his son. But my question was, what does some guy dying on a cross 2,000 years ago have anything to do with me today in 2019, right? What? Some Jewish guy died on a Roman crucifix so I am get eternal salvation? What? I mean, think about it for a minute. Do you like no, notice how odd that sounds? And then I came across this book. Actually, uh, yeah, I came across this book, What Was God Doing on the Cross? And that very, spoke very much to the issue of, I'm trying to figure out, like, what is God doing on the cross? My point is this. Christianity can stand the test of scrutiny. You can investigate it. It'll turn out to be true. But I encourage you, go ahead and, 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 and fully take on, if you have doubts, it does no good to pretend they're not there. So if you have doubts, share that with your pastors, with your Bible study leaders. Go through a book. Um, here's another good, uh, good example of this, right? Paul says, look, if, if Christ, if there's no resurrection, everyone go to the beach on Sundays. Don't be here, right? 
Okay, beach is kind of far from here. Um, <laughs> everyone, go, <laughs> that usually works. But anyways, whatever. Like, go do whatever because Sunday doesn't matter. In fact, nothing matters. We're still, nothing, everything hangs on the resurrection. Is there an afterlife and did Jesus purchase it for us? And, uh, and this is a good, great book. I'm sure many of you guys are familiar with him um, as an example of, of just the fact that we are, should be encouraged to read, read wisely. If you're in a place of doubt, wisely re- navigate to some books with people um, who can help you with that. The, uh, the, um, um, here's, a, here's a quote that, to that end, by the way. Uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, some of you guys are reading him in high school or reading him now, but he says this, it's not as a child that I believe in Christianity and confess Jesus Christ. My hosanna, my praise of God, is born of a furnace of doubt. When you go through doubt, and you really question whether this stuff is true, and you come out on the end, other end because God is faithful, he will bring you out on the other end, there is no holding back what you'll do for him, right? So if you're in a place of doubt, I would say don't pretend it's not there. Go fully into it with guidance, with community, with pastors and leaders, and, and ter- it'll turn out that God will remain true to you. Um, I, 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 oh, gosh, look at the time. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip over a couple things. Um, I'm going to skip over quite a bit, actually. Um, so, uh, well, look, I, I will say this. I will just say this. I think reading is a hugely important way to honor God. Let me just say this. Like, oh, man, for several reasons. One, it'll, be, it'll make you a more patient person because you have to wait till the end of the book to figure out what it's all about. You'll be more understanding because you're going to read someone else's perspective for two, three, five weeks or whatever. So you can be more patient. You'll be more understanding. If the world turns out to be true, somewhat true, you're actually going to be pretty successful too. As they say, every leader is a reader, right? Leaders are readers. And look at the people that you, you know, you know these people, right? Facebook, Tesla, and all the rest, right? They are readers. Now, it's not everything because some of their character is shoddy, like our homeboy, Elon. But, um, but, but it's a minimum that I believe. And, and I'll just tell you right now, here's a Christian author, his name, Philip Yancey. Some of you guys have read his books. Longtime Christian author. You know what he says in, his, in an article in Christianity Today? He says, I don't read like I used to. And he goes on and on. He's a writer. He's not just a reader. He writes books for people to read. For, he's had done it for decades. He goes, I don't read like I used to. And you know what he blames? Number one thing? Well, social media. <laughs> like our world is totally changing. Tim Keller, many of you guys know him, right? Because Pastor Kevin probably talks to him about a lot, which rightly so. Tim Keller, wise man, pastor in New York, a for, former pastor, a Presbyter, redeemer, he says, my, a, a friend of mine asked him, I won't tell you who, but tell them they're friends, and he, this friend of mine, older gentleman, I asked him, or he told me, hey, you know why Tim Keller didn't come out to California, the West Coast, in his last book tour? And he asked him, and Tim said, well, because they don't read out there. You know how upset that made me? <laughs> um, let's make that not true, but it's true for him, right? He said, no, I'm not gonna go out there because they don't read. And the way to honor God, one key way to honor God is to read books. Here's a quick application. Do it in groups. You're more likely, it's like having a workout buddy, right? You're more likely to go to the gym if you know someone's going to, you know, keeping you accountable. But the second thing is not just in groups. Do it with a mentor. Do it with someone who can, because that's like having a personal trainer, right? That's what a mentor does. It helps you to navigate what, what book you need in your life right now. Sometimes you're supposed to be reading William Lane Craig. Other times you're supposed to be reading the atheist Friedrich Nietzsche. And that's okay because God's truth never contradicts itself. Okay, uh, this is just too much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Pastor Kevin, oh man, Pastor Kevin, like this is trying to get in too much, I'm looking at the camera, um, too much in a, too little time. But I'm trying to just um, give you everything I, I can on these topics. So let me just move on to the third one, which is loving God with all our heart, right? Loving God with all our heart, right? Um, and just the one point that I would like for us to get here is that um, I believe God wants to, us to see him as his friend. That's, just, that's how we're going to love God with all our heart. Simple, simply put, we're actually never going to really love God with our heart unless we first understand the gospel. Unless we first understand that he loved us first. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman here by the name of... Um, so, the, you know, this is the gospel, so I just kind of um, shared that there. But there's a gentleman here. I was listening to him on a podcast. His name is Dr. Jack Deere. And Dr. Deere, you know, very, you know, uh, faithful Christian over many years, right, decades. Okay, look, he's like 70-something, 71, too. 
Um, he was, he's an author, mega church pastor, was, and then now smaller church, and then he was, a, he was even, even a seminary professor, right, out in Dallas. And so this young podcast host asked Dr. Deer, Dr. Deer, now that you're in your 70s, like 50 years ago, when you first started your journey with Jesus, when you're in your 20s, what would you wish that you knew back then that you know today? And my thinking is, okay, let's learn from the wisdom of people who have gone before us so that we can learn it on the front end. Are you with me? And Dr. Deer said, I'll tell you the one thing I've learned in the 50 years of life with Jesus, ministry and failure and success and all the rest. He says, the one thing is, I think God wants me to know that he wants me not to endure him, but to enjoy him. He actually wants to be my friend. And now that sounds weird, right? Oh, God wants, either sounds too cliche or sounds like, no way, I can't believe that. But let's think about it. This has biblical justifications. In John chapter 15, Christ says that he no longer calls us servants, but he calls us friends. But what does that mean to be God's friend, right? I'll give you an example uh, how I've been trying to live this out in my own life. Like, what does it really mean? Because I want to love God with all my heart, but to do that, I've got to figure out that the gospel is really, really true. So how do I do that? Lately, I've been trying to really take in, how do I enjoy God, not endure God? Enduring God is like, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. That's not what God is about. God is, I want you to enjoy this relationship with me. So how do I do, okay, so lately I've been trying to do it this way. Uh, it requires me to make a quick announcement, which is my wife and I are expecting our first child this year. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, I didn't expect that, but praise God. It was uh, an incredible, crazy journey. Some of, I know, I'm, all, I'm very sensitive about this, by the way, because I know some of us may be still on that journey. Our journey was eight and a half years of trying, praying, and it was, it was rough. It was extremely rough, it, and it still is. She's pregnant, but here's the point. After she's been pregnant, there's been some few minor scares along the way, right? I won't even get into all the details of it, but at some point, at a couple points, we were like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Now, at one point, we went to an ultrasound appointment, and we came out of the appointment, and the doctor said, hey, everything looks pretty much fine. You don't have to worry. You know, you're good. And we're like, okay, that's great news. It's one of those crucial ones. And then that, later that week, on Friday, we finally got the email with the fi like, official report, and it was like Friday at like at 8 p.m. or something. I got email like that late, so we can't call them. But in the email, it said something to the effect of some very worrying language like, I, it's something like po testing positive for high risk results or something like that. And we're like, wait, what is that? And specifically for one of these like, you know, conditions. And we're like, wait, what is that? Is it, is it positive or is it potential like risk, high risk positive? What does that language mean? And so for the whole weekend, I was just like, you know, everything is nerve wracking when you're a first time, right? Um, oh my gosh. I was like, what does that mean? And my wife was a little cooler than I was, but I, I was like, oh my gosh. And, but we, at some point, you know, over the weekend, we both got very worried. And we couldn't get in contact with the doctor. And I, immediately, I became Bildad. You guys know Bildad? Bildad is Job's friend who says, oh, because you're not pure, you're not upright. That's why there's sin in your life, Job. And immediately, that's how my mind went. I was like, oh my gosh. It's because of my own sin and wickedness of my life that my wife or my kid is going to have complications right? Like, that's how my mind, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys. That's where my mind went. Bill Dad, right? So we go in on Monday, and we, we call in on Monday, and we, it turns out, okay, you know what? Actually, no, everything is fine. It's just I had to write it like that because of legal reasons, but no, 100%, you're fine. We're like, oh my gosh, right? Like, over the whole weekend. Then a week or two later, we go in for another ultrasound, and when we go there, sure, it's always better, like, when you actually see it, right? And so we, we see the ultrasound, and we're like, okay, everything really is fine, and everything is just okay. Okay, good. Out of that appointment, we're done. I go to the bathroom afterwards, and I was nearly sobbing in tears. Not because God was harsh on me, but because of his kindness. I felt his kindness, right? That's the gospel. Not that he saved us once back then. He saves us every day out of friendship with us. That's what he wants, right? Let me just say, for some of you, I don't know if this, it may, this might apply to some of you, but are you willing to enter into the relationship that God has called you to on his terms? And his terms being kindness and grace and forgiveness. He's forgiven you. Are you able to forgive yourselves, right? So I think some of us need to hear that. I need to hear that. I need to get away from Bill Dad's false words 
and actually know that God is for us. That's the gospel. And if we're going to live a life of righteousness, it's only going to come because he first loved us. Are you with me? So that's the gospel. Let's, let's get that into our hearts, right? Um, I mean, I'll just share. Uh, we said 45, right? Okay, I just share. Oh, we'll take a little bit more extra time. Okay, maybe like three, four, or five, 20 minutes. Okay, just kidding. All right. Um, at a recent barbecue, I was at my colleague's home, and um, there, I'll just call him Rob. Um, this guy, Rob, was asked to pray for the meal, and there's like about 10 of us, 12 of us, and it just struck me. He's not a pastor or whatever. He was just a regular little Christian guy, and he prayed, but the way he opened the prayer really struck me, and then ended up sitting next to him over dinner, and we just chatted about that, but I said, I really appreciate the way you opened up your prayer, and he said, well, it's just being honest, and he said, God, we come to you with all our mess. <laughs> That's it. I mean, we're at a barbecue. It's just hanging out, 4th of July, you know? <laughs> but, like, he's just, that's where he is with God. And he's also about 70. I love hanging out with 70-year-olds because there's so much wisdom to glean from them. And that's the first thing he said because now he's got nothing to hide. He's been there long enough just to say, look, we're all messed up. And the sooner we can get that, not just once and for all, oh, God saved me from my sins, but on a daily basis, he saves us every day with the gospel I said, Rob, I, I really appreciate those words. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move then to, um, to the last point. Um, and uh, oh, I, I, guess, I guess I will say this real quick. Back to Tim Keller. Uh, speaking of 70-year-olds, I don't think he's quite 70, but one, one thing I appreciate about him is, um, again, I'm trying to learn things on the front end, you guys. I'm in my 40s, and I don't want to, I want to glean from the wisdom of those who walked before us, because life is hard, remember? Life is hard. So let me just take from every 60 or 70-year-old I can. But Tim Keller, just totally aside, okay, this is an aside, this is a whole other sermon, but he says, you know when people come to his pastor's office, when people come to his office and ask him, hey, how do I figure out God's will for my life? Am I supposed to do this or not? Do I take this job? Do I marry him or her? And so on and so forth. And they have all these questions about God's will. He says, I love it, right? He says, 99 times out of 100, I say to them, you have a brain, that's what he says. He says, you have a brain. By the way, Pastor Tim is loving, okay? It sounds kind of rude right there, but he goes, you have a brain. God gave it to you. You also have a community around you. They have wisdom. Make a decision. God will be faithful. And that's just so simple, right? Because m- most of the times you and I are like, oh, but what is it, God? And then you see a thing in the sky. Or like, you know, you're like, oh, it's that, right? Can I just tell you why I, th- I think we sometimes do that? Because we want to be so sure that it's from God that if anything goes wrong, you have someone else to blame and not yourself, right? But can we drink again from the gospel and says, that says, I got you. I'm for you. Don't worry. Life will be hard, but I'll be with you. And everything I'm doing is for your good, Romans 8, 28. Everything I'm doing is for your good. So don't fret and be so anxious. You do have a brain. He's given us wisdom and community and common sense. And so don't fret, because you're living like you don't belong to the king, right? And so, so Tim, I, so I want to learn from that. And he also says that when we make decisions, I'm noticing this, by the way, when I make decisions lately, and they're big decisions sometimes, he says wisdom is different from technique, open the Bible, get a word, and make a decision. Wisdom is not technique. Wisdom is, how he puts it, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, for years, decades, and eventually the decision you make will, have, will come from a character that's formed and it'll be the right decision. So wisdom isn't, oh, what's God's will right now? I need it by five o'clock. It's right foot, left foot for five, 10, 20, 50 years. So I wanted to learn that. But let me just move to the last point then, which is loving our neighbor as ourselves, right? And this is the last thing that Jesus says as he sums up the two great commandments that we have. Let's go, I'm gonna go back, remember Jack Deere here, I'm gonna go back. For 10 years, he wrote this book just last year. For 10 years, he couldn't write a single sentence, he says. Why? You're a writer, you're a pastor, you're a speaker. Why haven't you been able to write for 10 years? I'm gonna share some news with you that's a bit, I mean, as they say nowadays, like trigger warnings, it is a sensitive piece of news. But 11 years ago, before this all started, 11 years ago, one of his two sons, uh, remember the statistic I shared with you guys at the beginning of the talk here? the suicide, well, his son Scott is a statistic. He took his own life. The way it happened was very tragic. He was watching Fight Club, you guys know that movie? He was over, the, over identifying with the character in the movie where he takes his own life, but then in the character he comes and resurrects, it's actually a Christ figure in a way, but he resurrects in the movie. 
Scott took his own life watching that movie, probably on heroin, and, um, and of course didn't come back to life. Jack and his wife were praying, literally, son's head blown off, holding his son's head, praying for a resurrection, because he believes in miracles, as do I, and never came back to life. So this is, this is life. This is real life. You can't talk about life without talking about death. So this is Jack Deere, pastor, Christian man, so on and so forth, whose son took his own life in his early 20s. What Jack says in this book, he says, two things I learned in the darkest day of my life. One, and this is where he talks about how God actually, even through the crazy darkness of his life, God still wants us to enjoy him, not to endure him. God is for us, and he spells that out in terms of some financial things that happen in other ways that God really came through. It's really incredible. You should read the book. It's a very easy read. But the second thing he says is, the second most important thing I learned from my own son's death is that deep community is nearly everything to life. Deep, deep community is just about everything there is to life. What does he mean? When his son died, that news traveled in less than a day. They were in Montana, living in Montana at the time. That news traveled somehow all the way to California to some friends. Some friends from California contacted their best friends in Texas, the deer's best friends in Texas. And the folks in Texas called Jack's wife and said, honey, you gotta come down here to Texas. It choked me up too. We're gonna fly you, we just bought you a ticket. You guys, you, you two need to fly down here and we're gonna figure everything out together. It chokes me up because you see a picture of friendship. And so they, they did, they, they didn't know, they, they didn't even know what to, they don't know, what do you do? What do you do when this happens in your life? And some of us may know this firsthand. I have friends who know this firsthand. So they flew, they flew down to Texas, they get them from the airport. These, this couple happens to be a pretty wealthy couple down in Texas. They open up the home and they, say, they said to the deers, they said, they opened their home, they said, this half of the estate is yours, this half is ours, and we're gonna grow old together. I'm telling you, life gets hard. Some of you guys already know this. But having that kind of deep community and then having Jesus as our best friend is gonna make all the difference in the world, all the difference. Life will get harder. We have to be willing and vulnerable to take on, honestly, here's my orientation to life, as far as I can see it from 44 years of having lived it now. One or two best friends, and I mean godly, there for you to the very end, and one or two mentors, godly, God, not pure perfect, but loves God, loves you, and there with you to the very end, you'll probably have led a pretty successful life. One or two best friends starting now. One or two best mentors starting now. And I'll give you one last example of this. The second example of deep community and being in, uh, in loving our neighbors as ourselves happened just this past week in my own life. I can't get into it, but this past week was probably one of the hardest weeks of my life. And I think there's some spiritual warfare. It's because Pastor Kevin invited me here to speak. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but partly true. Pastor Kevin. Uh, partly true. Here's what's also going on. We're getting ready to launch this thing called The Blueprint. It's an online course that we're doing at my nonprofit. It's a pretty big deal. We've worked on it for the past eight months, and we're just launching it this month. And, it, and, and it's been consuming my life, right? So this past week, I get into this conflict with a relative. Let's just put it that. It's not my wife, uh, but it's a relative, okay? And this conflict was major. And I don't think I've been this upset at an individual, as I was telling my mentor, Oscar, it's like in years, decades, maybe my entire life, I was so upset with this person. And it hasn't resolved yet. It hasn't. It's just real life, okay? Like, that's just true. Like, there's a conflict going on, and, and I'm speaking to you, but one thing that has resolved is my heart. After two, three days of being so upset, somehow my heart got resolved. Here's what happened. <coughs> Nothing was working. Fine. Nothing was working. I was reading scripture as I do daily. I was praying with my wife as I do daily. I was even texting friends, you know, deep community, I'm going to live this out. They, and usually words of encouragement, my love language is words, so that was, but even that wasn't helping. I was exercising, I was trying to get it out other way. Nothing was working. Except maybe the power of prayer. 
of my wife and many others who I did text. And at that, that's the only way I can explain it. So midway through the week, I think this is Wednesday. It is Wednesday, I remember now. I called him just out of the blue. I, ha- I was desperate. I just called him. And I said, Oz, here's what's going on. Tell me that I'm over-spiritualizing things. Because I don't like to over-spiritualize. Oh, it's a spiritual warfare. That's why I can't find my keys or something, right? Like, I don't want to over-spiritualize. But it was so timely with the launch of this and the speaking engagement, a couple other things going on in my life. It was so timely. I said, Oz, am I over-spiritualizing or is this real? And the way he said it was just so perfectly timed. But he said, Rich, whenever we get ready to do anything of significance for God, we should expect there to be spiritual battle. And Dr. Guinness would be the kind of person that would know this. I mean, he speaks and writes all over the world and he's, you know, and so forth. And he, he faces it too. And so what I'm trying to encourage you with is this. Um, that deep sort of friendship, people who are committed to praying, having a mentor. And so lastly, one of my mentees, um, that about two hours, so after that phone call, by the way, I, I just, I, and he prayed for me for a few minutes too toward the end of the call, and I just began to feel my heart beginning to settle. It was just the middle of the day. It was like 12 o'clock or something, just the middle of the day. And my heart finally began to have a sense of peace. For like two, three days, I was just so aggravated, but it began to have a sense of peace. And of course, my wife was, other people were praying. And I shared this with my mentee. About two hours later, I met with my, one of my students that I mentor. And it's funny. He said to me, you know what I've been ask, I wanted to ask you? And he didn't, he's not even on Instagram, so I didn't, he didn't know anything that was really going on about spiritual warfare or whatever. And then he goes, uh, I wanted to ask you today, what do you think about spiritual warfare? And I was like, well, that's interesting. And he goes, I go, why do you ask? And he says, well, because every time I do something like He's been blogging for us a lot lately and stuff like that. He goes, every time I do it, everyone, everyone in our team and everyone else says, it's a great, he's doing great. He's an excellent writer. He's very young, but he's good. He goes, I don't know why, but I think, I even think, oh, that's a pretty decent, decent piece. And then the next day, I get convinced that it was like the worst thing I ever wrote. And it's not, help, what, and even if it is good, is it helping anyone? Like, and he gets into this, and I said, you know what, Charles Spurgeon, every, every single Monday for decades, some of you guys know this great preacher, he would experience deep melancholy, as he called it depression the very day after Sunday. Spiritual warfare is real. By the way, it's not just tables flying all over the room. That's how, that's how we think of spiritual warfare. But I actually think, I, I said, I, I almost said his, I said, I'll say, Will, I said, what if we just define spiritual not as like ethereal abstract tables flying, but as anything of or related to the kingdom, whether positive or negative, including conflict with relatives. Could that be counted as spiritual warfare? If the kingdom is all-encompassing, doesn't that matter too to God? And so I just want to encourage you guys with that. I know there's a lot said, and you know, um, my goodness, um, we have four-part sermon, or four, four sermons in one, actually. But, um, but if I could just encourage you, and that's why I did a handout yesterday. I just told Pastor Kevin, I'll just do a little bit of handout. It might help a little bit. But you guys, that's really it. It's the one or two best friends, the one or two mentors and the gospel that Jesus is our friend. If you can get that, I believe you'll have a start at an orientation to life. So let me just pray. Father, we just come before you and we lift all of this to you. Gosh, Lord, too many words, so little time. But I just pray that by your spirit and by the truth of your word, your gospel, you would get that into our hearts. I am praying, Lord, that every teenager and 50-year-old in here that's struggling with anything in life, whether it's mental health or whatever, God, help us to know that you're not against us. That the gospel is true every single day and that we need the gospel in our lives every single day. You are a friend. You love us even better than our best friends. And Lord, I pray that they would, uh, all of us would find, be able to do that well, uh, love you back um, in deep community. In Jesus' name, amen.